This podcast is a quest for well-being, a quest for a meaningful life through the exploration of fundamental truths, enlightening ideas, insights on physical, mental, and spiritual health. The inspiration is love. The aspiration is to awaken new ways of thinking that can lead us to a new way of being, being well. Welcome to Body, Mind, and Soul Healing Conversations. <laughs> this episode is about meditation and EMDR and how these techniques can help us to heal from past trauma. If you have had painful past memories or trauma that is difficult to get over or that is still influencing your current life, this is for you. Eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, an evidence-based research-backed approach that helps people heal from past painful memories and liberates them to live more fulfilling lives and not be run by past limitations and triggers. Todd explains the healing effects of meditation. He has been practicing meditation daily for years, and he has benefited greatly from his practice. Valeria interviews Todd Krieger. He is a marriage and sex therapist who helps couples create loving and passionate long-term relationships. He also helps people process and heal their past interpersonal traumas so that they are able to have the healthiest of relationships. In addition, he used the modality of meditation to help people access their best and unconditionally loving self, to live their best life. He is the author of The Long Hot Marriage. He has two healing infidelity products, his ebook, The Little Black Book of Infidelity, and The Infidelity Cure, a total self-help program for couples with six videos and a workbook to help couples heal and thrive after infidelity. In addition to all that he has, a program titled Divorce Proof Your Marriage, a powerful and dynamic audiovisual gem that will help your intimate relationship thrive. His latest project that he is absolutely thrilled about is his meditation and membership program, Meditation for Self and Interpersonal Healing. Meet Todd at toddkrieger.com. Here's the interview with Todd Krieger. In your own words, who is Todd Krieger? Well, Todd Krieger is a humble person. More and more I'm alive in this world. I realize there's so much I don't know about the world, about the universe, the cosmos, and even me. So I am this spirit, for lack of a better word, that um, is here to be part of this evolutionary impulse of the world, to contribute. Uh, you know, there is, there is a lot of negativity we see around us, but I do believe that I and all of us have the potential to be tremendously positive contributors to our lives and the lives of others. Yes, what a beautiful answer. So I have to ask you this question, <laughs> since you mentioned <laughs> spirit and it just yes. kind of makes me to kind of already think about spirituality. What is your idea of the spirit? What is it from your perspective, Todd? You know, I know uh, the different religions, different people are very black and white ideas. Yeah. But I think if in my case, I'm just open to the mystery mm. of who we are. I know that we have a body and we have a mind and that we're not just a body and a mind, but we have that and we live in it. And we listen to it, and it's helpful, and sometimes not helpful, the mind, I mean. But I think that there's this uh, essence. You know, it's, it's hard, right, to, when we, as human beings, to trying to come up with the right word. I think spirit's a good word because there's a sense of lightness and fluidity to it. But that uh, where this consciousness, where this consciousness, uh, this living, alive uh, consciousness uh, that mm. uh, can be aware, that's yeah. attentive, and that 
um, yeah, and I just want to add, as I as I get older, I start to see that a lot of it is, a lot of what we manifest is what we pay attention to. Mm, and so we yeah. need to be mindful of what we're tuning into, who we're tuning into, True. what we're listening to, and and to rec- and to, to try to be open to what feels the most true mm. and the, the, the and the most good. Yeah, I hear wisdom yes. <laughs> within your words. You mentioned earlier positive, making positive contributions. Mm-hmm. Is this the idea you have of purpose, having purpose in life? Would you say yeah. that this uh, is one of them? I think it's a human need. Uh, obviously, we have basic needs of, of food and sleep and water. And unfortunately, some people are living in just survival. So th- their life is about survival. But uh, for those of us that are privileged enough to not have to do that and, to, and, and our survival is not a concern day in and day out, that we have other needs, you know, and uh, we, we need to be able to tune in to our purpose. I think uh, our purpose, I think we're not spoon fed our purpose oftentimes. Sometimes some people just know it, you know, but a lot of times it's learning to be open, to trust uh, our, our bodies, our wisdoms. You know, it's, it's like I'll tell you a quick little story. I was biology major. I was pre-med. My whole life was about being a doctor. And long story short, um, I, I thought I was getting in. And when I didn't get in, that the last med school that I interviewed at and I didn't get in, I was absolutely euphoric. And I was very surprised. And it was early in my life. And I realized how little I had tuned into myself that there was something else. I didn't know what it was, but it wasn't that. That wasn't it. Uh, I, why would I be so happy that I, that I failed? Um, and so it, it's and then beginning to tune in uh, to this world of mental health and relationships got me, you know, and that's how I got into this field basically. But it's, it, you, know, you, you know, we have this need to ful- uh, fulfill our purpose. And when we're living off purpose, it can affect our health in all ways. Mm, so true, because everything is connected. Or yes. at least it feels like that. Body, Absolutely. Mind and, and consciousness, body, mind, as you Consciousness, said. yes. Yes. So you are a marriage, sex, and relationship therapist. When did you get the sense of living your purpose through doing this work? I would love to hear the inspiration for that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, some of it was just kind of luck, even though it's never luck, right? But um, it feels like luck. No, I mean, I, again, I got into the field that way. I mean, I just started to uh, question, and I, I had been in therapy, and I had recognized how little I knew of myself. And the more I got to know myself, the more things opened up for me. And so I, I, I decided I was going to do that. I was going to help people, as I have been helped. And that I had this great thirst for understanding psychology. Uh, I had already started doing some meditation. And so I understood a little bit about the, how the ego and the blind spots that we have. But then I think, you know, I just started doing a general practice. And then I got married uh, in 1984, been married 38 years. And and I went to a class in marketing as a therapist. And the therapist asked us, is I think 1986 or 87, and asked, who, who's coming to see you? And 70% of them were couples. So when I said that, he goes, oh, I guess you're a couple specialist. I said, I am. He goes, I guess so. So I just started studying couples and I started to go to trainings. And then eventually I started training other therapists in couples work. And, you know, I started to be the teacher and then uh, a partner in a group practice I was in said, Todd, you got to get a, do, do sex therapy, get, you know, get a, some kind of certification in sex therapy. So that's where I went uh, to an intensive program through the UCLA School of Medicine. I'm a USC Trojan, but I did go to the UCLA School of Medicine. We have a big rivalry here. Um, but, uh, and then I got certified, so I started doing sex therapy. And so it just kind of – and then sexuality – is one of those things that can be used for wonderful or for terrible, right? So um, I, and then just uh, kind of going beyond your question, then I found that when I was working with people that had low sexual desire, some of them were sexually molested and I wasn't helping them. So in 2014, I learned this thing called EMDR, 
which I know we may talk about later, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. And it's a trauma treatment. And when I started utilizing that, I was able to help these people who were molested to grow into their mature, healthy sexuality. So it's been a process like that, you know, where one thing leads to another. And and I do a lot of work with EMDR to help people like that and people who have been trying to heal from infidelity and so those kinds of things. So it's been a it's been a process, mm-hmm. good it, process. Yeah, it sounds very much like it. And I do have lots of questions for you about meditation in EMDR, right? Sure. But before sure. that, let me ask you another open question, Todd. What is your understanding of love? What is love to you? And what Actually, are some of the misconceptions we have about it? You know, it's it's a love. That's a great question, right? And you know, I'm not saying I'm the I have the definitive answer, but I have I have quite a big sample of people I've worked with that to know what love yeah. isn't and what love is. Mm, yeah. And what love love isn't a feeling. You know, mm. I, I've had people come to see me and they go, I, I fell out of love, and I say, mm-hmm. big deal. Who cares? <laughs> <laughs> yes. I don't care that you fell out of love. Everybody falls out of love. That's all chemistry. You, you huh. fall in love, it's it's yeah. chemistry, it yeah. feels great, takes no effort to fall in love. Mm-hmm. It makes no effort to fall out of love. So love, what is love? Love love is a willingness to extend yourself in some way, to grow beyond what makes you just comfortable. It's so if loving myself, which is also very important, means sometimes I need to Go out of my go to go out of the way. I mean, part of loving myself is doing programs like this. Like I, I used, I'm not nervous. I've done it enough times, but I used to be very nervous to do this. But I knew I had something to contribute. So it, it was loving not only to myself but to those that I was trying to inform to get out there and push. To me, that's loving. Um, to love others, um, oftentimes, means extending myself for somebody else. So if my wife says to me. You're not listening. What's what if I think I am? Then the easier thing to do is to say you're wrong. I'm I'm listening. But the loving thing to do is the harder thing to do. Some a lot of times, not always, but a lot of times. And that might mean bear that feeling or that sense of wow, you have a different opinion of me about me, and then be open to her be open to my blind spot. Maybe I have a blind spot that I didn't see and to validate and say, well, okay, that's what you're feeling. And I need to look at that. So that's a loving statement at that moment because it makes her feel significant. It makes her feel real. Um, I think that's the most important thing that we could do. I think that the most important thing that parents could do with the children is make their feelings valid. doesn't mean indulge them in every step of the way, but, uh, to to make them feel like it's okay to feel that way. It's okay to experience it that way. So th- it, there's, that's not easy, especially in the work with couples. The, 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 our fear, our reactivity, our defensiveness are big blocks to that love. And it takes some work to to do that. There was a book written called The Work of Happiness. And I think that you could also call it The Work of Love. Mm. You know, love takes work. Yeah. It's not automatic. It's not instinctual. Our instinct is to survive and to protect ourselves, mm. which oftentimes is the opposite of what we need to do mm. to be loving. Ah, that's a profound answer. Thank you for saying that so sure. clearly. That resonates 110 percent, a billion <laughs> percent, I would say, that's a trillion right. percent. And it <laughs> sounds very spiritual to me, I have to say, because that's yes. um, a lot of the practice that I engage in, which is learning or recognizing what is the the nature of reality of what's happening here what's this called life um what is this experience all about and that's what i I came to understand that everything is connected pretty much Mm -hmm. that you are the other (laughs) so it's almost a reflection it's always a mirroring a reflection i love that you are the other that's true on this level we're on on some levels we are we are connected it's a beautiful vision to kind of um, be able to realize that, that Absolutely. see humanity living as, uh, with that recognition that everything's connected, oh. that I am the other, it would have been a totally different reality. Oh, yeah. You know, I'll tell you this, uh, you know, I, I didn't mention this to you, but, I, you know, I, I've been a professor 
in USC School of Social Work for the graduate program. I just retired from there because I have my practice. It's, it's enough. But I did it for 11 and a half years, like 30 semesters. And the last classes I taught was on diversity. So I have this white professor talking to people of all kinds of colors, all kinds of sexual preferences. And I came to it real humbly because a lot of these students were in some ways more open than I was because I've been so conditioned to be divisive in my thinking. And it's been such an education. So, and just to see how diversity is so beautiful, you know, our differences are so wonderful. Um, and, uh, and I ended up getting the highest evaluations as a professor, but they don't know that I got so much out of teaching because I learned so much. <laughs> yes. that, that was the key. It was, it's, a, it's, it's not, it's much more beautiful to live. A, it's, it's, it's almost like it's a selfish <laughs> in a good way to live life like that, to live life realizing that underneath it all, we all are connected. It absolutely is. One of the challenges for me realizing that and really kind of closing the gap, especially my relationship with my husband, is that the more I attend to have that felt understanding that we are one, the less mm. I'm attracted to him. Oh, it's almost like yeah. we are already connected. I don't need to do this. Yeah. Sex is not, I'm not interested. So I'm wondering if this is something that I have heard it before. Of course, other people saying that, but not too many. Uh, have you heard? Yes. Th- yeah, I don't know if you heard that oh, before. Oh, yes, absolutely. I, I speak a lot about it. As a matter of fact, when I did trainings for therapists, my last trainings that I did before COVID, you know, it was, I called it the I and the we. And the reason I call it that is I find that there's a lot of paradoxes in life. And, you know, that's why I said on some levels we're connected, right? Because we are. But we're also different. And I think if we emphasize our, our understanding and we are, we are just being wonderful, loving people, which is great, we can lose our passion. That the passion <laughs> actually comes hmm. from having conflict, from disagreeing, from also from having separateness. You know that there's a separate because there's there's polarity. Like I have seen uh, people that in heterosexual relationships, for example, where they've lost their sexuality, and what we do is in, for for heterosexual relationships, I have found for some. The woman needs to feel more of the feminine and the man more of the masculine, sometimes, not all of the time, but means that he needs to take initiative. He needs to make things happen. Now, that sounds a little like patriarchy, which we don't want to say that. That's not what I'm saying. It's, it's, it's not like that. But, you know, we can be tuned in, sensitive, understanding, empathetic. We could uh, uh, appreciate our complexity. And yet we need to be different. We need to have separateness. Sometimes we need to be a little teasing, a little feisty um, to have the passion. You know, I wrote, you know, I, my book was The Long Hot Marriage. And so I did a lot of looking into that, like what, what makes people have passion and then lose it. And a lot of times is they, well, several things, but one of them is um, they're trying to get along too much. Like they, they don't, uh, they don't tolerate difference enough. It doesn't, again, you could, you could, you don't have to be cruel. There's not cruelty, but it's appreciating that you are different than me and we want different things and, um, and to not be, and, and to be selfish in that way, you know, self, self-absorbed is a problem. Selfish is not a problem. So, like, this is what I would like from you. You would want, oh, I'm not comfortable with that. Well, I can't make you do it, but, but I really would like you to do it even if you're not comfortable. Can we try this in the bedroom? Can we try that? I'd like, you know, and to honor our difference and our, I guess, healthy selfishness is what I would mm. say. Yeah, this is a, a different uh, perspective. I think I have heard something similar, but not exactly as you say. That makes sense to me from that perspective, from the human experience perspective, because nature, right? So this honoring yeah. our natural differences, because I am yes. in the female body, he is in the male yes. body. 
Yes. Yeah, that's nature. That's why we eat too. We need to maintain the body. So there's um, the yes. feeling pleasure through food and all that. I guess I talked to somebody else here on sexuality, and it's not a topic that I'm uncomfortable with talking about. It's just that it's not something that I'm interested in. Something mm-hmm. in me is not interested. I keep wondering why, and I, I, and I do a lot of meditation and self-inquiry, mm-hmm. but it's in the end, it's always asking me to, to leave as it is, accept what's yeah. happening as it is right. happening, not to force anything right. and try to control the process. I, I, I'll make a comment on that too, because part of my evolution as a person, but also as a therapist and even as a professor, you know, I, I remember teaching human sexuality and this one lady said, I'm, I'm asexual. I'm an asexual. That's what she said. And I went, okay. And I actually hadn't heard that before. I had not heard that. This was years ago. And I re- and I looked into it and I realized certain people, and I'm not even saying that's you, certain people may just, we're all different. Um, I do have a book. It's kind of right in front of me though. It's really funny. And it's called, uh, I, I'm just saying it because you mentioned it, but it's called Come As You Are. And it's a classic on sexuality. And it is... Uh, written by a woman, Emily Nagoski, and you you start to realize how you really appreciate diversity and how different people might have different sexual accelerators and different sexual breaks. And it's very, talks about the neurobiology as well. But I would say to you that you are right for not judging. There's a trust. This is where I'm at. Who knows? Who knows? I've learned that I need to, I need to like live in mystery and not think that since I help people increase sexual desire that everybody should feel that and they should all feel that in the same way or to the same intensity. No, we have different libidos, different levels. I, who's to say, you know, with, when I work with a couple, I just want them to find ways to make it work for them. However they do it, you know, that's the creative part of relationships. So true. In relationships, interesting. When I think about the word relationship, it takes two, of course. And the practices that I engage in, it, it happens after I I started engaging more and more with non-duality. It's Advaita Vedanta, the teachings mm-hmm. that I practice. Yes. yes. Oh, you're familiar with it. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm not an expert in it, but yes. And, and I do think it affects certain people right. in different ways. Remember I talk about attention. I think Yes. You know, because yeah. I, I see a lot of ther- mm. uh, meditative healers and, and meditative teachers and therapists, and many we're saying something similar, but saying something's very different. I think it comes to what we tune into. And when we tune into certain things, certain things become more important, certain things become less important. Who's to say that is what's right, right? I, I'm not to say what's better or worse. I know people that have, that are spiritual. They've been spiritual seekers and sexuality has not been a part of their attentiveness. And then there are others that are. Who's to say? I, I think it's fine, personally. Right. Yes, that's how I feel. And I love the word you use, trust. Yeah, that's uh, where I rest in trust. You mentioned earlier the word ego. How mm. do you define what the ego is, Todd? You could see that my training has been, you know, I've been mostly psychology, but I've done enough spiritual Mm -hmm. workshops and trainings to be dangerous or not so. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, dangerously uh, good. Yeah, yeah, I mean, interesting. I hope. Yeah, (laughs) no, the ego is the part of us that divides us, um, that uh, uh, is always trying to fight to survive. And of course, cavemen, cavewomen maybe needed to do that, but we're such symbolic creatures that. Um, we're oftentimes def- saying, this is who I am. Like you said, this is me. I'm a therapist. Um, uh, I'm a person that has a beard. You know, if, if it was yeah. video, you'd see that. Yeah. Um, that's <laughs> yes. not who I am. That's not who you, the, your first question was, who are you? Uh, and I think that the ego is constantly trying to hold on to this definition of who we are and it creates problems oftentimes because let's say I think I am this great husband and to be totally honest with you, I think there's a part of me that really identifies as a really great husband. (laughs) And my wife will say something like, you know, our whole marriage, you have been defensive whenever I bring this up. 
Now that interferes with my self-concept, which is part of the ego is I'm a great husband. So maybe, so if I cling to that, am I going to be able to tune into her? No. Am I going to validate her? No. Am I going to be able to be loving towards her? Probably not because she's messing with my, my ego, right? On the extreme end, you have someone who's narcissistic personality disorder. That person is living so much for the ego that anybody that scratches it a little bit is going to get their wrath, <laughs> their narcissistic rage. So yeah, the ego is that part that is constantly trying to define ourselves, which interferes with openness, fluidity, mm. wisdom. You answer my question. <laughs> yes, um, absolutely. It's very much fixed. Yeah, the idea yeah. is survival based. Yeah. And interestingly enough, I would add the sexuality of sex. It's connected to that. Yes. That's the survival of the species, right? Why we're yes. here. Yes. So for those who are not interested, really, or more interested in other things <laughs> that are not related uh -huh. to the procreation, uh -huh. I think it says something. You see, that's the mystery, isn't it? That's that. the I don't mystery. know. I have no idea why yeah, this is, is how it is. I became this way right. by, by being very interested in, in spirituality and, uh, yeah. and, and started with trauma. Uh, that's another yeah. Point. It started yeah. with trauma being yes. being hurt as a child. No, no, no. You're absolutely right. I mean, it, 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 it's well. First of all, the whole trauma piece is is very important, and you've had a lot of. Uh, I talk a lot about post traumatic growth, yeah. but through trauma, we could learn grow into, like you say, you're developing capacities where that's where that's where that's where you live. That's where you are. Um, yeah. You know, there is, there is, of course, people that do like tantra sexuality, yeah. where it's a, it's a sexuality with a much more spiritual emphasis. Right. There, but uh, like I said, we're all different and we all have uh, different tendencies. I've, I've known like my own sexuality is changed. I mean, it's not such an emphasis like it was back when I was younger. <laughs> sure. And it's not, it's not because of physical, because ah, I stay in shape. It's yeah. more about, yeah. you know, where my focus is, where my attention is. Right. So I think, you know, we all have our paths. I think the key is to be on a spiritual path of growth. Yeah. Thank you for saying that. Although I, I usually say these things here because that's where I come from, where I am now, <laughs> but mm -hmm. it's, there's no really, even if some of my guests, they they disagree. Of course, this is open for, so yeah. we can have a beautiful sure. conversation. Sure, sure. But I'm not looking for agreement. You agree with no. me or any of that. But I love your ideas of life. Yeah, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not doing this to be pleasing or agreeable. I'm doing it because I have really learned that there are, you know, I'm, I'm just open to what my, what works for every single person, every single couple, um, and that it's not all the same. And, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm, uh, my expertise is in tuning in, not that I have all the answers. Mm. It's it's actually more that I have yeah. the questions. <laughs> yes, <laughs> tell me about it. And sometimes even the question disappears. Um, mm -hmm. I have noticed that too. I'm just mm -hmm. kind I understand. Of with no questions at all. Even when I hear like you when you speak when you talked about love, what love is, and it's almost like everything disappears for a second, and there's mm -hmm. nothing else here but just that truth, kind of yes. holding itself. Yes. Just, yeah, it holds itself. It's just, uh, I can't explain how powerful it is. Everything else disappears. I'm like, yep. oh, this is yep. true. And that's how I know it's true <laughs> because it supports itself. It doesn't yes. need thinking or agreements. Or... So let's talk about meditation. I know this is, um, it goes back to spirituality in a way. I do connect meditation with spirituality. But I would love to hear about your own experience with meditation. And also the offer you have is a meditation membership program. This is yes. offered meditation for self and interpersonal healing. Talk to me about that and how to access that program. Sure, absolutely. So I, you know, I've been meditating for, for many years and, and I actually started from trauma too. You know, I was, uh, I literally was like, who am I? I thought I was this, but I'm not. It was just crazy, you know, and I was fear of physical fear, fear of my mortality. It turned out okay. Everything was, but, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, but, uh, it led me to meditation as well as this field that I'm in. And, uh, you know, I, I would say that I've been consistently meditating 
hardly miss any days uh, for like five years now, but I've been meditating since I was 18. So it's been much, much more consistent. And I do a lot of work with couples. And one day my wife said, why don't you do a like meditation for couples program? So that's, the, that's where the idea started. I've changed it up a little bit because I have people in my program that aren't in relationships, like intimate relationships now. And I don't want to restrict it to people that are. So I changed it to meditation for self and interpersonal healing. And so what I, what I do is I, um, I give people, every month has a theme of this program. So for example, the first month is listening from your depth. Um, uh, and I keep creating new, new, new months as, as this, as this program continues. Uh, my, my last month, I'm trying to remember what it was, but it's, it's, uh, it's, oh, oh, it's tuning into the love frequency. (laughs) That was the name of it. And I, and I try to make, so every month they get some meditations, they get me, they get live retreats, and uh, and there's the meditation, but there's always or almost always a part of the meditation, I incorporate an interpersonal piece of it so that you could take what you're experiencing in meditation to anybody. It could be your intimate partner, it could be your sibling, your child, your parent, and so you know, it's just my brand as a couple relationship therapist. I have learned that it's all connected, and I give them a practice guide, and uh, it's 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 my passion project. I've been loving doing it. Like I said, I'm in. I just finished month nine. Some people have been in the program from the beginning. They join it in month one. But when we do a live retreat, we're all in together, and we're all just doing this retreat together, and uh, it's uh, it's great. And uh, how they could reach it. Well, you know, your people probably, this is what I would like for them, just to email me, uh, you know, because I have a page for them and all that. But let, email me directly at Todd at ToddKrieger.com. Tell me that you heard me on your podcast. That would be great. And it's T-O-D-D at T-O-D-D-C-R-E-A-G-E-R.com. Todd at ToddKrieger.com. And just email me that, and I will give you the information so you can check out the program. It's very reasonable. It really is. Uh, they could find out. I mean, I could tell you. That the, yes, please. The, yeah. the introductory, for, yeah. for the, the first month is $7, but it'll be $47 a month after that. So, But for $47 a month, they're getting a, a great value, and um, they belong to this growing community. Yeah, that's wonderful. I'll have the information with your email under the podcast oh, profile. Because that's that to you. It's yeah. easier. Yes, yeah. I'll have that here. So, what is the if med- meditation has one goal? What would that be, Todd? From your perspective, to go beyond your mind and to ha- to access the part of you that is free from ego to access the part of you that is the purest part of you that is beyond your trauma that doesn't mean don't deal with the trauma it's, i do that on, you know with emdr but that the meditation helps people access the part of them that is pure that is who they really are and it you know as you practice it you you know you know when you're at a meditation you can still get triggered we're all human but because of the you know the more you consistently meditate when you're out of meditation you suddenly go wow i was i wasn't defensive or wow I, I i took that chance that i might not have taken if i was clinging you know if i have to be a success if my ego i have to be a success i'm not willing to fail well if i meditate and i realize well that's not who i am i am this i'm this consciousness i'm this loving spirit then it's a little easier to go for it, take chances. And when you take chances, you could give more in a, in a bigger way. And so there's so many aspects of it that I think, but it's the basic short answer to your question is it helps us get in touch with the part of us that is not limited, that is beyond the mind, mm. that is a, a pure essence. What's not to love about it? <laughs> That's it. Yeah, right. It's, it's all good news that we have this. This is who we are. <laughs> I know, isn't it? And, and so many of us don't know. It's not a it's an open secret, isn't it? 
it's an open secret. You're so right. It's right there. It's kind of waiting for us. And uh, I, f- I forget it's there. Yeah. I, I forget it's there. So I go, wow, that, that was a lot of forget, a lot of forgetting. Yeah. But we could, you know, it's good to remember it again. Yeah, that's it. Perhaps that's the reason why you are here in this reality, doing this work. Would you say that most of our traumas, or those who have had the experience of trauma, come from relationships, relational traumas? Don't, definitely. Of course, people, you know, combat veterans have trauma and, you know, people that get in car accidents, that's traumatic and can be life changing, you know, physical traumas. But I think the people that I see that what I'm working with day in and day out, and this is like it could be, you know, interpersonal trauma and the trauma could be abuse. It could be neglect, but it also could be more subtle than that. There could be attachment wounds where, like I referred to earlier, the parent just wasn't able to tune in. So the child is happy about something, but the parent is stressed because they're dealing with an alcoholic spouse and they don't get excited f- with the child and for the child. And the child starts to go, wow, I'm all alone in this. Of course, pain too, but I'm just saying joy or pain, but they, they no, you're not mirroring who I am. You're not tuning in. That can be trauma. So I, I'm just pointing out this, so th- that, but in, an interpersonal trauma has been found to be much more pervasive in its symptoms than non-interpersonal trauma. I mean, in my case, it's just, um, it's stated for a long time. It's almost like something that you can't really be released from the symptoms, but it's still there. And I wonder if it okay. ever goes away. The memories won't go away, but there's a, it's almost like that sense of trust. It's really not something that I would do it again. I would not trust those who have hurt me when I was a child. So, yeah, I think that's wise. Yeah. One of my themes is learning how to have to do wise forgiveness. And I use the word wise because wise forgiveness is I'm forgiving in a way that serves me. You know, I, I cannot, I mean, again, it's, we're not selling out our intuition. So as I work through the trauma and I'm not as traumatized like I do with eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. So I'll have a person tuning in to a certain trauma, uh, and we, we try to make it as quick and painless as possible because we start processing it. Um, then by the end of it, they're looking at that memory going, you know, I felt it was my fault, but you know what? I feel fine and I'm wonderful. And that's what I want. That's what we want. That's what that person wants. But that person doesn't necessarily forget that it happened, nor do they start to treat a person who hasn't grown as someone who's safe when they're not safe. So there's wisdom there, right? Yes. We know the difference. Yeah. Yes. And that kind of saddens me in a way that I, um, like now I, I'm not able to trust some of the people from my, my childhood. Sure. But I don't feel yeah. bad about it. Right. I don't, because I know they yeah. had, I'm not, I don't feel safe around them. So that's, yeah. uh, that's okay. That's and, a healthy, that's a healthy reaction, feeling sad about it. And, but, but being okay about it because, you know, it's not what you wanted. And so there's a grieving that has to take place. And I don't know. I mean, that's a big, that's a big lack that, you know, we want our parents, our uncles, our aunts, whoever, uh, to be those people that we needed, not the people that they were to us. And so it, there is a sadness to that. Yeah. That's for me, that's the feeling, right? Yeah. That's really, it's sad. Um, uh, what's another question that I have for you? Well, I want to mention your services too, Todd. I think you mentioned pretty much all of them. Relationship counseling, divorce therapy, counseling, sex therapy, sex addiction, infidelity, toxic relationships, EMDR therapy for trauma. You just described the process um, briefly here. Marriage therapy and coaching, private couples retreats. I love that. When I read yeah, it, yeah. kind of the heart yeah. opened coming together to heal, healing together, couples, retreats, and then consulting. Yeah, and I do everything virtually these days. Yeah. (laughs) I I took to it after after (laughs) the whole pandemic thing. So, uh, yeah, I can work with people wherever they are. That's wonderful to know. Thank you so much again for what you do. I love your clarity. I love how simple and profound (laughs) you sound and you feel to me so thank you for your presence thank you i appreciate it and then i have the ending questions for you but before that todd is there anything that i forgot to mention or you left unsaid um no i think you were right on you were good you hit it 
So yeah. we covered most of the things. I know the book you mentioned too. I'll have the link of your book to uh, the long sure. hot marriage that will be on your podcast profile as well. <laughs> right, right. So let's see. I have the ending questions. I'll ask you this one. How do you define success these days? What is to be successful to you? Success is being loving to yeah, yes. <laughs> myself and others. What a beautiful answer. I keep saying that beautiful because you see, when you say that, it's just there's nothing else to say. It's almost like right. everything disappears, like uh, that, right. that can right. live on its own. <laughs> right. So you know true. that I was at a retreat. I was in this group practice. I referred to it real briefly, but this yeah. I, I hired this facilitator. It was four men, and he asked the question, "What is success?" And after I heard their answers and mine. <laughs> Uh, it was my beginning of saying, I have to leave the group practice. <laughs> ah, <laughs> we were not, yes. It wasn't a marriage, a business marriage. That's right. funny that you asked that. What is success anyway? Right, right, yeah. yeah. And my other question for you is, I'll ask this one. What three experiences you wish everyone to have before they lose the body, before they die? Wow, that's a heck of a, uh, let me think here. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I want them to have the experience of being worthy and valuable and lovable. So that would be one answer. I want them to have that experience. I want them to have the freedom to experience themselves as contributors to people, the world, in whatever way that that is their gift. And I want them to know what it feels like to just play, to be able mm -hmm. to play. Because mm -hmm. yes. when we talk about people that are in survival, they don't do that. But to just be able to play, whatever play means to them, just to play. Mm. Like life is not a, just about achievement. Mm. It's about just being in the moment and playing however you play. Yes, truly beautiful. I keep saying that because I can't find another word <laughs> to relate to humans that kind of they resonate to me as a flower <laughs> mm -hmm. being beautiful just by being itself. It's yes. not actually trying yes. to be beautiful. Yeah, I like that. So true. Yeah, thank you so much for your presence here today, Todd. Oh, you're beautiful. welcome. That's and great. before we say goodbye for today, where is the best place to find more information about you besides contacting you by email? I'll have that as well. Well, my website, which I really think is a very good website, is... Just simply toddkrieger.com, T-O-D-D-C-R-E-A-G-E-R.com. On the website, there's uh, all kinds of videos and other articles and information. And uh, you could, you know, all kinds of topics that we talked about, you and I today. Yes, and I'll have the link on your podcast profile. Thank Great. you again, and we'll talk soon. Bye for now, Todd. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you for listening. To learn more about Todd Krieger and his work, please visit toddkrieger.com. Also, Todd offers a meditation membership program, Meditation for Self and Interpersonal Healing. For more information, please email him at todd at toddkrieger.com. To learn more about this podcast, please visit fitforjoy.org slash podcast. Thank you again for listening and bye for now.